hear me? Okay. Um, so this is uh, officially seismology lecture four, uh, but it's inverse theory, so I'm actually not really going to have any seismology in it. Um, it's seismology related. Um, it is also July 14th, so happy Bastille Day. <laughs> okay. There's not as many pictures in this in this lecture because this is I, I'm converting a, a class I do entirely on chalkboard into a 90-minute PowerPointy sort of thing. So I, I you know so I had to put some pictures in here. So Bastille and Philippe left. So that you're right. Um, okay. So basically, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, the real basics of what we mean when we talk about inverse theory. You know, what are forward problems? What are inverse problems? What do we mean, linear and nonlinear? Um, and uh, uh, talk about the classic sort of approach, the way we, you know, the way this is initially taught, the way most of us learn it first, and um, uh, a little bit more about uh, the way of evaluating models um, uh, and all of the ingredients that go into this. Um, and uh, uh, and throughout the throughout the lecture, I'm going to have various slides that I call takeaway. These are I I I discover when I'm giving talks that I get distracted by things, and I'm I'm sure that's also true when you're listening to talks, you get distracted by things. So I've got um, various slides throughout where I want to take away the the most important points from the last little section we did. So um, and um, I know this is cider, so I assume I'm going to be interrupted constantly, and that is great. So please do so. Um, so, like I said, there's a lot of text, and I, I hate doing text things, but I just don't know how to do this otherwise. So, but uh, you know, inverse theory it kind of uh, seems like uh, it, it sounds fancy and mathematical, but basically the the whole idea is we start with something that we have the physics to describe how to predict the data, um, any sort of any sort of data, um, and so if we've got um, uh, 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 the physics or chemistry or whatever it is to predict our data. Sorry, I'm still adjusting to uh, being in Santa Barbara here. I've got to get my energy going. Um, uh, that's the forward problem. That's the going from uh, our model of what the Earth is, using the physics to predict whatever our observed data is, whether that's seismic travel times or amplitudes, or whether that's uh, uh, X-ray diffraction spectra. Um, there's a, a million different things that we can predict uh, using physics or other uh, scientific approaches do the forward problem. So physics, I, th I think of it as physics, but you can use other sorts of fields. So the, in order to know inverse theory, you have to understand the physics that goes into creating the forward problem. Um, a lot of the techniques we use to go in the other orders. So we've got observed data. We want to figure out what model best predicts that observed data. That basically is in the field of linear algebra. So those of you who had math minors as undergrads or, or majors or things like that, you probably had to take this course. Um, these, are, these are the tools that we have to go to you know, reverse the process, to go back from the observed data to the model that we want. Um, but really, the key that ties it all together is probability and statistics. That's, the, the, that's the, the glue that brings it all together, because all of the data we're talking about are uncertain. They all have uncertainties on it. And we have to know, as we go back towards the model, how those uncertainties uh, propagate, how we can know what's the, what, what's the range of acceptable models, what, what goes into this. And so this is kind of the glue that holds a lot of this together. Um, it's useful to kind of think about this um, and, you know, a few kind of simple examples. So here, here's a, a relatively simple example, and this is what we call a continuous problem. Imagine that you've got a, a, a continuous set of measurements of the gravity field over some unknown buried mass. Um, we can relate that with physics in some sort of integral equation. So um, the data as a function of x along the surface is a function of uh, the unknown mass at depth. Um, and this sort of integral expression is, is kind of underlies a lot of this. Um, the, this is, you know, I, when I, I throw a lot of equations in here, and I don't use equation editor. This is LaTeX for anybody who ever uses equation editor. Don't. It never works. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I just put all of these things are images. But anyway, um, the, this G. Uh, multiplier here, which is a function of both the position of the data measurement and the position of whatever the model is, um, 
is, uh, is, is sometimes called the kernel of the integral. So sometimes when you hear um, tomographers talk, they'll talk about what kernels they're using. That all stems from this terminology of, of, of uh, an integral expressions. And this is, you know, most of the physics we're talking about can be written in equations like this. For this particular example, the physics that we'd put into this G term would be Newton's law of universal gravitation. That's what, you know, that, that's the fundamental physics that goes into this, and it, and it shows us how to relate, relate a mass at some depth, at some distance r from various places along the surface, how um, that affects the gravity measurement at that point. Um, and so this is a Fundamentally, like most problems, and at least until you get down to the quantum level, it is a continuous problem where you know, we, the gravity field is continuous, the mass is continuous. But since we do most of this in computers, uh, we end up making these things discrete. So instead of it being uh, 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 continuous integrals we're talking about, we end up turning all of these things into vectors that are sampled versions of that continuous problem. So the data. Um, for the example of trying to see if I can write on the chalkboard, can, it, it, nobody's going to be able to see it if I write over here. So I'll, I'll okay, I'll, I'll 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 come back to that in a minute. So, but the lights are over here. Uh, okay, I'll 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 wander as it works. And I I just have a little bit of chalkboard stuff, but I can put it off until I can put it most of it together. Um, so uh, the uh, the data is sampled. Um, you know, in the example of the gravity problem, it'd be sampled in space. Um, it could be a continuous line uh, that you're just sampling every one meter or one kilometer or whatever it is the length scale you're looking at. Um, for seism for uh, seismology, we're usually talking about sampled in time, waveforms sampled in time. Um, it can also be collection of measurements taken in all sorts of disparate locations. In tomography, we're often talking about travel times recorded for lots of different source and station pairs. Um, that's just reducing the data to a discrete vector. So we're calling this the data vector. And the physics then um, uh, is uh, reduced to some function of a model vector, where the model vector is the sampled model. So we're taking, um, for example, in a tomography problem, you can imagine uh, taking, I'm going to start doing the screen here. OK, so just a little bit of light. And um, so, I mean, for a tomography problem, you can just imagine, in the simple 2D case, you could just breaking it up into blocks. And that's our sample model. We would, uh, in a classic um, linear tomography problem, people over there probably have no idea what I'm doing. OK, um, so uh, in a classic linear, to, uh, linear acoustic tomography problem, you can imagine, you know, uh, uh, in a material science perspective, sticking transducers on the edge of a, uh, of a uh, uh, material and you're just shooting ultrasonic signals through this and you can think of breaking the material up into a bunch of little boxes that are parameterized by slowness because that's what we do in seismology we, we make everything upside down slowness is just one over velocity the nice thing about using slowness is then we can just say add up the distance times the slowness and that gives us travel time so that's nice um, so uh, the, we break up the model into blocks in this case. Um, uh, and uh, lots of people talk about model parameterization. There's lots of different ways of doing this. But the idea is you reduce it to a finite set of coefficients that describe the model in some sort of discretized way. So now we've, uh, um, uh, now we've got the idea. The physics can be put in this sort of expression here. Um, the, the, the next question is, is it linear or nonlinear? And this is actually not a trivial uh, thing to say. It all often depends on model parameterization. If we go back to the idea, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> I'm actually going back to the chalkboard. I was. This is. I just. Uh, <laughs> I am so sorry. But this is the only. This this first little bit. I have a little chalkboard stuff, and then the rest of it's lovely PowerPoint. Um, so um, going back to this idea of the gravity problem, I like the gravity problem because it's easy to talk about the differences between linear and nonlinear. Um, let's imagine that we've discretized our model such that we've just got a bunch of observations at discrete points on the surface. And what we're wanting, so imagine this as a, a really simple problem. We know somebody buried some gold somewhere. 
and, and we want to know how deep it was and how big it is. And, um, and so in physics, we'll imagine it's a sphere, because that's what you do in physics. Um, so we'll imagine it's a sphere right here, and we'll put that, we know it's, we know it's location, it's at x equals zero. Um, and we can uh, have our stations this way, our x equals negative numbers, our stations this way, our x equals positive numbers. And if we know this thing is a sphere, um, uh, and it's, we want to know like how much gold it's got versus how much silver. We might have uh, you know, an idea of what different sorts of density contrast we're dealing with. And so we can parameterize this with how big it is, its radius, and um, how dense it is, and how deep it is, some depth b. And that's a very logical parameterization. Those are the things we want to know. Um, and so if you stick that into Newton's law and work it out, if you ever took uh, a geophysics class, uh, you probably worked out what the gravity anomaly associated with a buried spherical anomaly is. It's that. I'm not going to derive that. That's the joy of doing a 90-minute lecture instead of a class. Um, so it works out to this. You've got something that's related to the volume of the sphere, the, the density anomaly, and then things related to the geometry, how far away you are on the surface from where it's buried and how deeply it's buried. And this is nice. Um, and so we could think of setting up an inverse problem with this, but the problem is if our model vector is r, delta rho, and b, if I look at this equation, it's nonlinear, right? Um, we've got r cubed in there. We've got crazy b over b squared to the 3 halves. This is definitely nonlinear. So um, it's not an ideal problem for some of the techniques I'm going to talk about. A lot of the techniques we're talking about work better if the problem is linear. But we could do a very similar problem, and instead of thinking about this as a buried sphere, we can imagine that we've got a whole bunch of buried pixels down here. Each one is fixed in location, and it has an unknown density anomaly. And so you can imagine a sphere as being some density anomaly centered on, on spheres at a certain depth, uh, centered on pixels at a certain depth. But the nice thing about setting it up this way is the geometry is fixed. All of the nonlinear terms in here are related to the geometry of the problem, how big the sphere is, how deeply it's buried. If we we're just looking at which pixels have density anomalies, you can write it this way, where this is the volume of your particular pixel. That's set when you chose your parameterization. I'm setting this thing has a volume of x. So, um, and how deep that pixel is, z and um, how far that pixel is from wherever your data was recorded. Those are the only three things we're talking about, and those are fixed at the time you choose your parameterization. So you've chosen your parameterization, um, and so now our model vector is just the density anomaly at each pixel j. And so this is now linear for these delta rho j's. So we've now got a linear problem here. Um, and so the beauty of having a linear problem is that we can write it as a matrix equation, which lets us access all these tools of linear algebra that mathematicians have spent decades developing and proving ad infinitum. Um, and so this, is, you know, the, all, this opens up a whole field of things you can do. Um, so this is written in, in matrix form. This D is our vector. Uh, for tradition, this would be a column vector, and we usually have that as a column vector of, we call it length n, capital N data. Um, M is our model vector, which has length M, capital M. And then G then is a matrix that's got N rows and M columns. And what I realize when I'm saying this out loud, N and M often sound the same. Um, so, but this is the way it's done, so you're just going to have to get used to it. If you don't know what I'm saying, please ask me. Um, so N rows by M columns. I'll try to use my enunciation here. Um, if we can write this in index notation, um, uh, uh, a matrix multiplication, you could just write it this way. You're just summing over the, uh, uh, the j elements of m and, and, and multiplying it this way. The nice thing is uh, Albert Einstein used a lot of this sort of notation. If you ever have read any of his relativity papers, they're actually kind of fun. I, I 
<laughs> um, anyway, so you could actually, we call this Einstein notation here where you just leave out the summation and just know that you're summing over the repeated index. Um, I'm not actually going to use that anymore, but sometimes I throw that in and I might throw in some indices later on and not realize it because I think a certain way and sometimes I forget what I've said. So, um, so if you ever see something like this where you have indices and one's repeated, that means you're summing over it because that's just what you do um, in all of these sorts of uh, problems. Um, so for the particular example I just did on the board, um, di is the gravity anomaly measured at one point, x sub i. And we have n of those. Um, mj is the density anomaly at pixel j. And we have m of those. And uh, gij, in this case, has all of those geometric terms. All the physics gets dumped into this matrix right here. In this particular case, the physics is just these geometric terms, the volume of pixel j, the depth of pixel j, and the distance from pixel j to uh, um, point i cubed in this case. But so the, this, this is all sitting right there. This is, you can see that this depends on both i and j. So you've got this fully populated matrix. Um, and so like I said, we have n data measurements, m model parameters, g is an n by m matrix. And um, what was I going to say here? Well, is that all clear? We got, that's the basics of setting up the forward problem and turning it into a linear discrete problem. And there's lots of examples you can come up with. Yeah? Okay, so I guess for the benefit of the, of the students, I'm going to ask this. Great. Yeah, I don't know where they are. Oh, Bill. Got to keep Bill on his feet. <laughs> um, so the question that I have, or that, that Max and I have, is so what you've done is you've gone from a problem which has some un n data and three unknowns to a problem that has n data and much greater than three yes. unknowns. Yes. And so maybe some of the students m are wondering why on earth this is an advisable thing to do. And the, the question is, the answer is it may not be advisable. I'm just pointing out that problems can be parameterized in different ways. So you can set up the same basic problem in different ways. Some of them may be nonlinear, some of them may be linear. There is nothing inherently wrong with doing a nonlinear problem. You can do nonlinear problems, and there are lots of tools out there for doing nonlinear problems. The tools I'm going to talk about in at least the first half of this are aimed at linear problems. And so it's advisable to maybe think of how to set some, something up linear. Now, that's not saying that this particular problem is going to give you a very good answer. Um, this is the, the joy of inverse problems is you can get answers. And I'm going to be going back and forth on this idea. but um, Basically, it's always, almost always possible to set up your problem that you put in the right collection of linear algebra tools. You've got your data. You've, parameter, you've chosen how to parameterize your model. You'll get an answer. Whether that answer means anything is the next step, trying to understand whether that's a useful answer. Um, it might be that since we wanted a sphere at one particular point, we really want to parameterize that it that way and use a nonlinear approach to get at it. Good question, though. Um, lots of ways you can set up linear discrete problems. I already mentioned acoustic tomography. Um, in that case, our travel time, we set up a path, um, and we have our pixelated model, which for some reason in seismology, slowness is u. I don't know why, but I, well, often. Well, no, no, I understand why we use slowness. I just don't know why it's u. U is used for lots of things. And this is one particular thing that U is used for. I saw, I saw a little bit of Ed's lecture, and I, I, you, you brought up U, right? So they, they know what slowness is. No, so the nice thing about using slowness is it makes it a linear problem. You just have the distance of the ith travel path through the jth uh, uh, pixel um, is, is, are the elements of your matrix. It's a really easy matrix to calculate. You're going to be calculating a matrix much like that this afternoon in the uh, tutorial. Um, it's actually for surface waves, and it's got some other little quirks on it. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. But this is a nice linear problem, and so you've got a nice matrix here. Um, any sort of curve fitting you can set up as a linear problem. So let's talk about the simplest linear regression. 
Um, you have a bunch of uh, Ys and associated Xs that these things are observed at. And, um, and you're trying to figure out the, mod the model vector, which would just be A and B, the slope and the intercept. Um, this sets up a matrix um, that's, that is N by M, so it's however many data you've got is N, and M is just two, so you've got two columns of your matrix. The, uh, in this particular case, the first column would be the X sub I's of each one, and the second column would be one. Um, and so that's a, a very simple problem that you run into all the time. Um, X-ray diffraction, just to put it in, in something that uh, many of you probably that are not seismologists have dealt with, um, probably you've seen X-ray diffraction. You know, if you've got a series of spikes at different uh, diffraction angles, um, you can basically think of this as a curve fitting problem. It's so, and since it's a curve fitting problem, you can set it up as an inverse problem, and that's really what you're doing when you push the button on your uh, x-ray diffraction thing and it tells you what the various components of that are, it's doing curve fitting, it's giving you an answer, and it's really doing inverse theory. So you're all using inverse theory even if you don't think you are. Uh, so, um, if you've got data and you're getting a model, it's inverse theory. Um, okay, like I said, takeaway slides. I put these in here just to rem remind you what I've talked about and remind me what I should emphasize. So uh, basically, the physics, the science, all of the stuff, the, the lab work, this all goes into setting up the forward problem, understanding how you go from a model to an observation of any sort. And you have lots of choices you can make. And so just saying, I'm looking for what anomaly is at depth is not telling you how you're setting up the forward problem. Um, it's not telling you uh, the whole story, you really need to go to the details of how you parameterize the model, all of that. Though all of those choices matter and how the inverse problem ends up working. So for the same problem, it can be linear or nonlinear depending on how you approach it. So by setting it up linear though, we are allowed all of the wonderful tools of classical linear algebra. And so um, we actually end up can break up the model, the, the problem, into various uh, end member sorts of approaches. In an ideal world, which never exists, you could have an even determined problem where you have n equals m, and then in that case, all we have to do is take the inverse of our nice square uh, G matrix, and that can give us an estimated model. But in practice, even if we did happen to observe the exact same amount of data as model parameters, we just set it up that way, that we had the exact same uh, data, you'll discover that G is almost always singular. Um, it won't, uh, singular is a mathematical term that means you can't find, you can't create the inverse of this model. Practically speaking, what this means is any time any particular data that you've recorded can be expressed as a linear combination of any other data you've recorded, that means it's not Invertible. It's a singular matrix. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the classic example, well, actually, I'll do this in a second. I'll do a classic example of this after I finish this slide, because then I'm going to do a bunch of board stuff. Um, there are problems that are purely underdetermined, where you have much less data than model parameters. So the example that Ved was just asking when I had why I, I made a whole bunch of, uh, of blocks there, I could, I could make a thousand blocks and have six measurements at the surface. That is an underdetermined problem. Um, and so if I've got an underdetermined problem where n is much less than m, um, in general, if it really is purely underdetermined, you can find a model to match the data exactly. There, there are models that will match the data to the as many digits you, as you recorded them. Um, but there are actually going to be an infinite number of models that satisfy that data exactly as well. So uh, the answer is not trivial, then you have an infinite number of models you can choose from that exactly satisfy the data. Um, we're going to talk later on exactly how to quantify this a little bit better, what I mean what, when understanding what, what's the infinite number of models. Um, you can also have purely overdetermined, where you have much, much more. Um, I wrote these backwards, didn't I? I just wrote them the same. I just reversed that. OK, that's, <laughs> that's a typo. Why, why don't I fix that? No, nah, OK. M is less than n. 
I, you know, this is the joy of PowerPoint. I always discover errors while I'm actually talking. Um, okay, so M is less than N, so you've got less model parameters and data. This is actually more like where we're usually at in geophysics. We usually have lots and lots of data. Um, of course, this is a site about planetary science where we often have no data, um, <laughs> but uh, um, but you know, in the, in, at least in terrestrial geophysics, we usually have much more data than model parameters, and uh, it turns out that data is mutually inconsistent always because it, even though it's only sampling one Earth, it always has errors associated with it, and so um, uh, and even and additionally, our model, our Earth is not actually described by the limited number of model parameters we're choosing, so we're never going to match the data exactly. In the, any overdetermined problem, it's impossible to match the data exactly. Um, um, but the nice thing is, at least in theory, it's possible to exactly resolve all model parameters um, and for a model that minimizes that misfit to error. So you're going to have misfit, but you can ideally resolve all model parameters. Um, the nice thing is we set up all of these things and the mathematicians like this, but in general when we set up any real geophysics problems, it lives down here um, where it's what we call mixed determined. Um, and uh, what happens in this case is there are some portions of the model that are oversampled. And so therefore, due to the inconsistencies of our data measurements, it's going to be impossible to match the data exactly. But there's going to be other portions of our model that are not independently sampled enough. And so those are not, those combinations of model parameters can't be resolved. And so the real world lives in this mixed determined area. Um, I'm going to raise the screen for a little bit. I got a little bit of chalkboard interlude here. Um, not too much. Not all the way up. I know it says on there. I, 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 I read the <laughs> I read the thing. I don't know what I don't know what happens if you put it all the way up, but probably B. B on my computer. Well, that's clever. I, I don't know why I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like I said, most real-world problems exist in that mixed determined land. And I think one of the best examples of this is let's think about the most simple acoustic tomography problem you could imagine. Let's put a 4 by 4 grid. And we say we put our little transducers on here. We got our little transducers on the side and at the top, and at the bottom, and we make four measurements. We've got four blocks, we make four measurements. We do down this column, down this column, across this row, across this row. We've got four unknowns, four slownesses. We got four measurements. This is even determined, right? Uh, but it's not. Uh, it's actually not. It's just one of these things that drives me crazy because like you try to set up an example in class and then it's singular and you're di disappointed. The reason why it's singular is that when you combine these two measurements, you're getting an average slowness over the whole thing. When you combine these two measurements, you're getting an average slowness over the whole thing. What this means is if I have these two measurements and this one measurement, I can predict what this measurement should be. They're not linearly independent. We actually only have three independent measurements there, here even though I have four measurements. And so since I have two different ways of constraining what the average slowness of this material are, is and that I have data errors, I'm never going to get the data to be consistent. And so this, if I tried to do an even determined problem and invert this matrix, uh, MATLAB would yell at me. It would say singular matrix. Um, and you can try this. It will. It yells pretty quickly. Uh, <laughs> and so while this looks like an even determined problem, it's actually mixed determined. Um, it's overdetermined in terms of specifying the average slowness, but since we only have three independent measurements and four model parameters, it's underdetermined. So it's this combination of underdetermined and overdetermined. And even though I set this up as about the simplest problem you could, you get that. And so obviously, when we make things more complicated and we're looking at the mantle and we've got stations all over the Earth and very uh, heterogeneous sampling and all of that, we're always going to be in the mixed determined land. So, but given those end members, we still can set up strategies for how to approach it. So let's think about the overdetermined problem. 
basically, in that case, what we want to do is we want to find an answer that minimizes misfit. And so we can define a misfit vector, E, which is just going to be a vector, that's an M. My handwriting is horrible, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, I have a couple of my students in the audience, and they've sat through multiple classes of mine where you know, I'm covered in chalk, and nobody has any idea what I'm writing. Um, but that's, that's how I work. So we've got, it's just, we, it's, it's a, a vector of length n. It's the same length as the data vector. And we're just taking the data vector minus the prediction, the predicted data vector for a particular model. GM is just the predicted data for a model M. So we've got a, 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 a misfit vector, E. And generally what we want to do is minimize that in some fashion. And one way to approach minimizing that is to think about minimizing the L2 norm of this. What do I mean when I say the L2 norm? Sometimes you'll see it written this way, a little two down here, L2 norm. Um, one way of writing the L2 norm is to write it like this, which sometimes in linear algebra you'll see written as a dot product. It's all the same thing. All we're doing is we're taking each element of the misfit vector, squaring it, and then summing all the elements up. Um, that's, that, that's all we're doing. So we want to make the, the smallest summed squared errors. There are lots of different, you know, there are lots of different ways of defining minimizing this vector, but this is the one that's most commonly used. You can use other norms. Um, L1 norm means you're just uh, um, minimizing the sum of the absolute values of them. Sometimes people will talk about L infinity norms where you're just minimizing the largest misfit. Um, the, the, the lots of ways of doing this, but this is the most common one. This is, I, if we were to uh, um, talk about this from a statistics and probability point, this is actually the one you'd want to minimize if your errors are really Gaussian. Um, in reality, they're probably not, but we always make that assumption. Okay, so it turns out if you set up this problem, um, you can just set up, you know, taking this thing transpose times itself. Um, and then take the derivative of that with respect to model parameters, and you'll get an answer. I'm not going to, once again, if you were taking my class, you'd have to go through the derivation of this. I'm not going to torture you with that. It's an index soup. Um, but trust me, this works out. You end up with something that looks like this. And you don't need to know all of the details here, but this is a recipe. We've got a recipe now. I, I, I say this is the way to get the answer that minimizes this. If I have an overdetermined problem, this will give you the answer. Now, it turns out if you have a mixed determined problem, this matrix will be singular and it will complain to you. MATLAB will be unhappy. Um, but this is the answer if we have a purely overdetermined problem, which we can come up with examples of, even though in geophysics we almost never do. Um, okay, so that's, that's one particular example. If we have an underdetermined problem, we have a different problem. If we were to minimize misfit on an underdetermined problem, we're, we're, we're going to get a million answers because we can make the error zero. We can exactly match the data. We have enough model parameters that we can always exactly match the data. So in that case, we have to come up with a different criteria to figure out which among those infinite number of models is the one we want to use. Um, and in, there are lots of different ways to think about this, but the simplest one to think about is, well, what's the simplest model I can use to satisfy the data exactly? And that sounds great, but what's the simplest model? But one way to think about that is the model that's the smallest. So if we, uh, what, so then what we want to do is minimize the L2 norm of the model vector, the one that has the model vector closest to zero. That may or may not be a, a good choice for us, but that's a starting point for thinking about how to do this. And so then, instead of minimizing ETE, we're minimizing MTM. And you can go through and say, OK, what's my answer that, that minimizes that, given the constraint that it matches the data exactly? And there are nice mathematical tools to do that. And once again, I won't, I won't make you go through that. But in this case, we get an answer that looks like this, I think. If I remember correctly, I'm just you know doing these things from memory, but so it's oh and there's a negative one here because <laughs> you always have to invert something. It's inverse theory. 
Um, so, uh, so this is a, another recipe. Once again, you know, we could go through the derivation. You could think about what this means. Um, this matrix right here in a mixed determined problem will once again be singular. Um, so this technique only works if you really have an underdetermined problem. If it's overdetermined, this will fail. If it's mixed determined, this will fail. But we have the n members here. Things that are way oversampled, we can use this example over here, which is called the least squares solution. I'm sure you've all heard least squares regression, least squares fit. That's the least squares answer, answer over here. This is often called the minimum length model. Um, this is what you use in a purely underdetermined case. The simplest way we can approach the mixed determined one is to minimize some combination of the two of these. We want to minimize a combination of misfit and model size. And so what we can do is just arbitrarily say we're going to minimize something that looks like this. So we're going to minimize some combination of them where you, I've added in an arbitrary parameter epsilon squared. Um, that's saying the weighting that you want, the relative weighting you want to put on minimizing model size versus minimizing error. So in mixed determined situations, we have to combine these two end members. And once again, I'll just write out the answer here. And no, you don't have to memorize all of these, but I did just teach this class last semester, so it's still stuck in my brain. Um, and so now the matrix we're inverting is the same. It looks a lot like the least squares problem, but we've added in this extra term, this epsilon squared i. I is the identity matrix in this case. So basically, we're adding in on the diagonal of this squared matrix, we're adding in elements that stabilize the inversion. Um, it goes from being singular in this case by adding in stuff along the, the, uh, the, the, the diagonal of the matrix, we stabilize the inversion, and we're able to invert the matrix. It's no longer singular. And, and, and so that's mathematically why we do it. And the justification for it is we're looking for this compromise. Yeah? Yes, it's a scalar. That's a great question. We're going to talk a little bit more about how you choose it. But it, the, yeah, OK. Uh, so in case uh, the unknowns are not enough and you have a lot of data, I think you can easily uh, higher your resolution to make to create more unknowns and change the problem to the over, over parameter one. Just, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. I, I mean, if, if you have not in, enough unknowns, for example, if you do seismic tomography and you, you yeah. have I, I think you can easily uh, hire your resolution. Sure, you can always make unknowns. more unknowns. We can always add That's more right. model parameters. That's absolutely true. We can always sample the model more thoroughly, add in more anisotropy, what have you. We can add in more things. Yes. But that doesn't get you away from this problem. Just because you have the same number of model parameters and data, it looks like an even determined problem. But the matrix is still going to be singular. Uh, OK. It's not, I, I, I set up, and that's a, that's a, a good point, because I set it up initially saying even determined is n equals m, and that sounds like it would be ideal. Um, but like I said, even in our simple case where we have four observations and four model parameters, it's actually not even determined. It's singular when we try to invert. And that's going to be true in almost every geophysical problem. So you're still going to have to think about these techniques. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And... The point over here was uh, saying that um, epsilon squared is a scalar here. So this is not a vector. It's just a single term here. Um, this, this term right here is a form of what we call regularization. It's a way of um, putting constraints on the model. Um, and this particular type is called Tikhonov regularization. You don't have to remember that. Um, but uh, the, the point is um, it is an arbitrary choice. It's something that is in the hands of the inverse theory person that they can do to stabilize the inversion. Um, and uh, it's something you're going to want to explore and see how it affects the model. I'll get more to that later, but sure, go, go ahead. 
So uh, I understand that it's it's a, a parameter that you need to do in order to make the the uh, uh, matrix invertible. But does it have some physical meaning? Well, it's or the it relative weighting. Physically, what we're doing, it's the re the relative weighting we're putting on minimizing misfit versus minimizing model size. So if I make a bigger number, that means I'm putting more of a penalty on complicated models. And so I'm going to push the answer towards simpler models, but the misfit's not going to be as good. We're not going to match the data as well. If I make it a smaller number, I'm putting more emphasis on matching the data very well, but I'm going to get more complicated models. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. OK. That's all the chalkboard I'm going to do for now. <laughs> Joy of PowerPoint from here on out. <laughs> but trying to teach without getting at least a little chalk on yourself. So I think this is important. Uh, OK, so if I, OK, chalkboard interlude. Um, so takeaway number two is we've got recipes now for these n-member cases. So for the overdetermined case, you've got your least square solution that looks like this. Um, uh, for the underdetermined case, you've got your minimum length solution that looks like this. I, 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 once again, I, you don't have to memorize this, but understand if you have the ability to set up the forward problem to figure out what g is, um, you can stick it into these recipes and get an answer, what our estimated model. And in mixed determined, you minimize both with this relative epsilon squared parameter. And so we're, uh, we, ha we have recipes for these in-member cases. This is the most basic idea of how to get an answer given a forward problem. Um, but we want to be a little smarter because not all data are created equal. Um, not, uh, not all data are equally well resolved. Um, uh, that's basically assume that all data misfits are equally important. So uh, it's saying if one measurement is just as good as any other, and so we want to match them all equally well. Um, but in the real world, not all data is created equal. And so um, one, one logical thing to do is weight something based on how certain we are of that measurement. Um, Anybody who's done real data knows determining variance is not actually trivial. Um, but but uh, let's say we have a, a good estimate of the variance of a particular measurement. Um, then a logical weighting scheme would just be to say, I'm going to weight each data by one over its variance. So things that have very small variance means we know them very well. That's very well resolved data. So that's going to have a high weight. If it has a big variance, we don't know it very well. We're going to weight that one down. It's going to have a small weight. So this matrix right here, I've written out as CD minus 1. That's the data covar inverse data covariance matrix. It's just terminology I'm throwing out here. But this is just, and, and oftentimes we think of this as a diagonal matrix. It doesn't have to be. But in general, we think of this as a diagonal matrix that on along the diagonal, we just have 1 over the variance of that particular data. Now, once again, anybody who's actually done real measurements knows that it's not actually not necessarily trivial to say what the variance is. So this, this to some extent, is also an arbitrary parameter that we can throw, throw into here. But hopefully, it has some basis. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if we can't rigorously define the variance, we can at least put data and categories. So this is category A, really good data. This is category C, not so good data, all of that sort of thing. And we, we can assign a small variance to category A and a large variance to data to category C. Um, there's lots of options here, but the idea is we, we weight this. And basically what this does is that we, we end up with a weighted version of the forward problem where we're pre-multiplying by this inverse data covariance matrix. And when we put that into, so this is the diagonal matrix. Um, uh, and so we can put that into the problem, and that transfers over. Uh, no, uh, this may be a bit of a technical question, but when you build up this matrix, do you actually build up a matrix of the variances and invert it, like CD well, minus if it's, one? If it's or a do diagonal you put up, matrix, of course, it's But when trivial. it's not? <laughs> but when it's not? When it's not, um, I mean, you can invert the matrix um, if you actually do have covariances between data. So for people who aren't following the technical details here, 
what basically what, when I say a diagonal matrix, that's assuming that all the data are actually independent. It's assuming that my measurement A has no influence on my measurement B. And oftentimes, if we're being honest, that's not true. Um, there are correlations between data. And so you, your co data covariance matrix should have off diagonal terms. Um, so in practice, you could invert it. Uh, you know, and to be honest, when I've used this, I've almost always had it diagonal, because we just make that simplifying assumption. You, sometimes you, know, you, know, you do down weighting uh, of groups of data that you're assuming are going to be correlated. I do, I've done that a lot. Um, you, you, so you actually down weight the data to appro approximate that. There are usually ways to kind of get around actually having to invert this matrix. Um, but anyway. And the trivial case of it being diagonal, of course, inverting it is just taking the diagonal elements and doing one over them. OK, so we can weight the data. There's an idea of we can think about mathematically, we can think about weighting the model. It's easier, to, better to think about this as regularizing the model. We're, we're putting constraints on what we expect the characteristics of the model to be. And so the simplest case I talked about was coming up with this minimum length solution or the, that combined solution, which we actually call the damped least squares solution, um, is that you're just putting a penalty on model size. We want the model to be as close to zero as possible. Um, but that's often not a really a good idea. Yeah. When you talk about minimizing model size, for the case of the acoustic tomography, really it just means you want the density difference of each square to be as small as possible. You're not like yeah, so, I you're mean, not cutting down on the number of voxels or anything like that, right? Yeah, no, you're minimizing the the actual amplitude of the model. You know, so you're not changing the number of model parameters. That's fixed in this case. We're just minimizing the amplitude of the elements of the model. And that's one way of defining a simple model, but it's not necessarily the best way of defining a simple model. Uh, yeah, that was my question too. I, I, I'm still not really sure what you mean by the amplitude of a model. So yeah, and that, I'm trying to, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm getting at it here. So it is, a, it's a great question, and it doesn't really, it's just one way of defining a simple model, and it's. I do that because that's how linear algebra sorts of people think about doing this solution to an underdetermined problem. But in reality, that's really probably not the best way of defining a simple model as being a small model. So in this case, you know, in the tomography case, that'd be saying looking for slownesses that are as close to zero as possible but match the data which doesn't really make sense. That, that you're actually pushing it towards high velocities then because you're pushing it to low slownesses. That's probably not a good definition of simple model. That's just a mathematical definition. And it's the simplest mathematical one. But we're going to get to right here talking about different ways of defining simple, defining minimizing the model size. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I, I just want to add to that. Uh, so the simplest. I think problem that you can think about where the size of the model makes sense is if you're fitting a line to a bunch of points. So this works for the geochemists in the audience as well. <laughs> so when Mark says we, uh, that we're penalizing model size or that we want to pre prefer the smallest model, that would be a line with a y-intercept of zero and a slope of zero. Okay. So you're and so as you increase the y-intercept or the slope, then you know, the y-intercept squared plus the slope squared is going to be some larger number. So you're minimizing that number. It's kind of weird, right? Yeah, it's not necessary. It, you know, once you understand physically what a simple model is, that doesn't necessarily make the most sense. It's, it's, a, it's a technique that was initially developed by mathematicians. That seemed like a good idea. Um, but it sets up the basic idea of how to do the math. So really what we want to do is we want to make a smarter definition of what a simple model is. And that depends on the problem. Um, this, the most common thing you want to do is say, well, I want a model that's close to some reference model. So for mantle tomography, we've got PREM, which is wonderful. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> um, uh, we, we've got PREM. It's a great starting point for what the mantle looks like. We have very extensive constraints that, on average, the mantle looks somewhat close to that. Um, and so uh, our, our 3D structure shouldn't be too different from that 1D average structure. And so um, what we, instead of just minimizing the model size, 
we want to minimize the distance of the model from some reference model. So I can write that out this way. So this M in angle brackets is our expected model. That's statistics notation. Um, but you can also think of this as your reference model. This is your starting point. It could be a 1D model in mantle tomography. It might be a 3D model that you're starting from, that you're looking for perturbations to a 3D model. Um, it can be lots of different things. But you're saying, I'm minimizing the distance from a reference model. Um, and we also may want to minimize other characteristics of the model. So the roughness of the model. We want to minimize difference, differences between adjacent cells. If we've got two cells sitting right next to each other, they shouldn't be too different, we think, because we have an expectation that the model is smooth. We may not really have a smooth model, but there might be reason to ex uh, expect the model should be smooth. And so that's another thing we may want to minimize, the roughness of the model. And all of these different characteristics of defining what a simple model is um, go into this category of what we call regularization. Um, and for you know, just to think about how that, that concept of roughness turns into a matrix thing, something we can stick into these recipes, you can think about um, defining a roughness matrix. So uh, this matrix D is actually just the... Um, the finite difference approximation to the first derivative. All we're doing is taking, in this case, we're assuming the model is just sampled uh, in one, one uh, uh, physical dimension. So we're just, say, for the example of the, the um, uh, gravity model, we have, we're, maybe we're inverting for a 1D uh, set of uh, perturbations of velocity with depth. And we want to minimize the, the gradient, effectively, of that model. And so we want to minimize the difference between model one and model two, model two and model three. And so by multiplying by this matrix, I'm, uh, uh, this is defining the roughness. If, if M1 and M2 are very different, and M2 and M3 are very different, this multiplication right here, D times M, is going to be a very um, large value. And so that's a very rough model. Um, and so if we want to minimize the roughness, we can talk about minimizing this expression right here. And if I go through my linear algebra, if I take the transpose of a, something multiplied, I just get, I reverse the order and take the transpose of the two things. And so I get something that looks like this. And so I can group this DTD as some weighting, model weighting matrix. Um, and so now, instead of minimizing just MTM, I'm minimizing something that looks like this. I've got, I'm minimizing our distance from a reference model, and I'm minimizing the reference, r the roughness. We can come up with lots of different ways. If you wanted something that had a minimized second derivative, it, uh, you know that, that that's uh, you, I could make a matrix that has something that looks like one minus two, one, and a whole bunch of rows like that. Uh, that's one way of doing it. There's lots of different ways of defining matrices like this, but the idea is you can define a solution like this. Got to move fast. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so in, in the tomography problem, if, if your reference model is spherically symmetric, um, isn't minimizing the roughness and minimizing the distance pretty much the same thing? No, there are two different things. So minimizing the, minimizing the distance from the reference model is pushing everything to low amplitudes. But you could still have low amplitudes that are rapidly oscillating between neighboring pixels. So uh, minus 0.1 to plus 0.1 to minus 0.1 um, is small in terms of distance from the reference model, but it's still rough. So there are two different. Th there really are two different things, but they're all obviously related. <laughs> If you push down the amplitude of it, you also push down the amplitude of the first derivative. Um, but push it, they're, they're related but different. Anyway, if you stick in these weighting, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry. I don't think I need this. No, no, because they're recording it. And so, uh, okay, yeah. sorry. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, uh, referring to your previous slide, right, that that expectation of smoothness, just perhaps to give a sense to some of the students in the audience, that's related to your expectations on the length scale of heterogeneity that will affect seismic velocities. Right? Exactly. So there is a physical relationship between, you know, how smooth you want to make the model and what your expectation of what 
dynamics yeah. that uh, does to the mantle in terms of uh, heterogeneity that will affect the yeah, ideally that should be exactly how we define the smoothness. So we say, well, we want to have, we, you know, we think the mantle is only varying on a thousand kilometer length scale, and so that, but of course in reality we have lots of seismic evidence that shows the mantle is varying on much, much smaller scales. So, um, you know, the, the, so you're getting to a very good point, but th this is how to um, implement smoothness. Um, so anyway, when we put in these new weighting terms, our least squares thing becomes a little more complicated. We, now, we still have these GTGs and epsilons and all of that, but now we have the data weighting showing up in a couple places, and we have this model weighting term here showing up where we used to have just have an identity matrix. So, but it's sitting in that same spot where it's damping the thing we're inverting. Um, just to point out all the terms here, this is that model weighting matrix. We saw how that was defined. Um, the data weighting shows up in two places, um, and uh, the, this bit right here, D minus GM with the angle braces, this is the misfit of the reference model. So in this case, we're looking for this whole term right here gives us a perturbation to the reference model because we've got the reference model plus some, some big term here. And the perturbation of the reference model is a function of the misfit of the data to the reference model. So lots of letters up there, and I understand nobody's going to memorize all of these letters. Um, that's fine. Um, but this, these are the ingredients that go into a damped, weighted least squares inversion. And the question earlier about how do you constrain epsilon squared in this case, um, that's uh, this goes into this idea of trade-offs. There's always trade-offs. All of these regularization parameters um, are, in some sense, arbitrary. Um, I, you know, ideally, the, the data variance is constrained, but in reality, there is some unknown fudge factor in that. So even CD is unknown to some degree. This um, model weighting matrix is inherently arbitrary. We're putting weight on how smooth we think the model should be, how close to some reference model it should be. We're putting lots of choices here. And so what you'll often find is if you start playing with these terms, this is just the simplest case when you're only comparing, when you're just doing the simple damped least squares, not even adding in roughness constraints and all of these sorts of things. You're going to get a trade-off where if you make that epsilon squared value big, you're putting a lot of weight on model simplicity. You're going to get a low, uh, mo a small model vector size, but you won't match the data very well. So you get a big data misfit. So high damping puts you out here, where the model is very small, very close to the reference model, but our misfit's still very high. It doesn't match the data very well. Over on the other end member, you are um, matching the data very well, your misfit gets very small, but your model becomes very, very complicated. And, um, and almost always we get something that's shaped like this if we plot these things up against each other, something that's an L curve. It gets a little more complicated with real problems, but this basic idea of an L curve comes in. And the interesting thing about this curve is you can see that as I start changing epsilon out here, um, I'm rapidly increasing misfit, but not making the model much simpler. I mean, this, this line is going almost horizontal here. So making a small change to epsilon makes the misfit go way up, but you're not actually making the model any simpler. Over here in this part, it's going almost vertical, which means I'm changing the damping, and it's uh, slightly, increase, uh, slightly decreasing the misfit, but you're getting a big change in model uh, complexity. And so in theory, ideally, this is somewhat conceptual, but we want to get somewhere on the elbow here, where you're in the compromise. Um, this is not well defined, of course, because um, anybody who, you know, geo geochemists should know how to plot things on a log-log scale. If you do this, you can discover that you can make this thing look a lot of different ways, depending on what scale you use. So defining the elbow is not necessarily trivial. It, 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 looks, it looks like it's real, uh, uh, real easy to say, well, here's the elbow, but if I plotted this with a different scale, the elbow might look like it's down here or over here. So there's, it's not as simple as just making this plot and picking the point in the, the middle, but we want to conceptually look for somewhere that's in the comp compromise between these two end members. Got another question. Thanks. So I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the mechanics here. So 
And if you are um, setting up a problem, you would just uh, do a bunch of inversions with different values of epsilon and kind of have an initial look and say, okay, this is every about good where I need inverse to be. approach should explore the regularization space. You, uh, if you, uh, if you have been a careful modeler, you should look at the reasonable range of all of these parameters and look and see how that changes the simplicity of your model and your fit to the data. So, so there's no way, like a priori, to be like, okay. Epsilon needs to be two in this case. You have to just no. Basically, no. I yeah. mean, I, I'm gonna I, I, in, the, in the second part. I'm gonna have a little more definition of what these matrices could be defined as, but um, in general, no. You have to explore the space. Can I, I mean, can yeah. I comment on this? You also lo have to look at your model because as you get go to a more and more rough model, you will see in the model that there are places which don't make sense because you actually be, you're fitting noise basically. Yeah. The other thing is that um, you have some expectation that your epsilon value is the is the ratio of your data uncertainty to your model uncertainty, because it's about if epsilon goes to infinity, then all you care about is fit is making the smallest model. Mm -hmm. right, you're saying the model is as close to my reference as possible. I know that's true. But if epsilon goes to zero, then you're saying I know nothing about my model. All I can do in this inversion is say that I need to fit my data as best as possible. So there is it does have some kind of physical meaning that you can start from. Yeah. So this is obviously so late, a little bit later in the talk, I'm going to say that the weighting matrix, you can actually relate to model covariance matrix, and the, the data weighting is the data covariance. And so the ratio between those does affect this epsilon idea, what our expectation is. But um, in reality, you have to explore. Um, so once again, in order to get a reliable answer, we need to weight the data to focus on fitting the most reliable data. Um, in order to get a reliable thing, we need to regularize the model, model weighting, regularization. These are things that have to do. And so these terms are often not well constrained by the data. So this, when you're evaluating a model that you've gotten from somebody, you need to know what's the range of reasonable parameters here. To be an a, a intelligent consumer of inverse models, you need to know what went into that. So this is, this is, I think, the most important takeaway from here. You need to understand how regularization affects the model. And if the, the paper you're reading doesn't convey that, send an email. Um, ask about it. You know, this is, this is, this is important. Um, there are uh, lots of papers out there that are over-interpreting details of models that are not well constrained by the data. Um, you know, you, you can't, so, uh, be an intelligent consumer of inverse models. Okay, so anyway, we have an answer. <laughs> we have, I, 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 could, I have a whole set of recipes um, with those previous equations. You're always going to get an answer. Um, but uh, we're only halfway there because we don't know what the significance of that answer is. Um, uh, so, so we want to know a little bit more detail about evaluating the model. Um, and so the, the two kind of major ingredients we can think of evaluating the model is the model resolution and the model error. The model resolution is given the geometry of the problem, the geometry of the data collection, how you parameterize the model, how are we able to image target structures. So we can say, well, if I had a slab here that ended at 200 kilometers depth, how would that show up in my model? Um, you know, these are, these are the kind of questions you can ask. And we can also ask, given the errors in our measurements, and what our model constraints are, which is actually the model regularization, what is the uncertainty of the resolved model? So these, these sound like they're kind of the same thing, but they're actually um, two different things that trade off with each other. I'll get to that in a little bit more detail. But in terms of dis defining the resolution, we can once again use the tools of linear algebra here. Um, and so for any particular solution, we can define what we call the generalized inverse. So if it were a simple least squares problem, we can just combine this matrix multiplication here into one matrix we call the generalized inverse. Um, any other one we could put in there. The, don't worry about the details here. It's just for any particular inverse approach we, can, we have, we can just define what's that matrix multiplication we're doing here. And so and we can also define the predicted data for any target model. So the classic one you see are checkerboards. How well can we resolve this checkerboard? So um, we can put in that what we're calling the true model, that's our, our target model. We multiply that times g and we get some predicted data. And if we want to know 
Well, if that were the real data, what would we see when we ran it through our inverse approach? We could just do g minus g times the predicted data, which is just this g minus g, g, m true. We combine this little matrix multiplication here, and we've got something we call the resolution matrix. It's basically like a filter. We're saying, this is my true model. Filter it through our inverse process. See what happens when we turn the, prank, turn the crank, and we get some filtered version of that model that's been smoothed, that's been damped towards some reference model. All of those things we've done, this, uh, this, this shows how that resolution effect happens. And we're going to do this this afternoon. Yeah? Um, Could get the... So does this mean that if we see one of these checkerboards and it doesn't look like a checkerboard, we should be happy because it should be damped towards prem or it should be damped towards some... Well, you shouldn't be happy. You should, it's, it's showing you what, the, what the, the, the approach is doing, how the damping is affecting the resolved structure. And a single checkerboard doesn't tell you much um, as, as, as an important takeaway message. But I mean, if we were putting in a 3D reference model, yes, and then we would expect that we should be trying to look like our 3D reference model and trying not to look like a checkerboard. Sure. Um, yeah. So, but this is not saying that a checkerboard test is not saying that whatever comes out will look like a checkerboard. It's saying if the real Earth looked like a checkerboard, would we recover that checkerboard? You could also put in other target models. I'm going to get to that in the next slide. Um, but uh, the classic thing people always do is checkerboard, so I'm showing that here. Um, this is actually an example from what you're going to do in the tutorial this afternoon. Um, if you've got surface wave data that has sampling like this, red areas are places that have lots of sampling, blue areas are places that have relatively little sampling, and, uh, and we run, in, run some checkerboards for a particular choice of regularization. You're going to explore all of this this afternoon. But for relatively big checkers, you can see we recover them pretty well. They're slightly smoothed. The edges blend. So you can see you've got lots of light blue in between the red and the blue. And the overall amplitude is slightly decreased here. Um, uh, uh, if we do smaller checkers, you can start seeing the effects of coverage here. You've got pretty good amplitude recovery in this area where it's red, where it's well sampled. In other areas, it's more smoothed. That's because we have less data constraint here. So the model constraint, the regularization becomes more important where the data does not sample it as well. So geometry is important. Regularization is important. Now, this particular test, um, it doesn't, the way this is implemented as just a simple resolution matrix, it doesn't account for data errors. You can be smart and add random noise to your predicted data and do all of that. There are lots of things you can do to account for that in a resolution test. But just a simple resolution matrix does not account for data error. And you really should beware the checkerboard, because what a checkerboard tells you is how well your data resolves a checkerboard. And the Earth is not a checkerboard, so that's not necessarily great. Um, it gives you an idea of like how well it resolves different length scales. If you see lots of checkerboards, and for a very small wavelength structure, nothing comes out. And for a large wavelength structure, you see it perfectly. That gives you an idea that you can resolve wavelength, long wavelength structure. But um, like oftentimes, we're wanting to know, for example, you've got a model that looks like this under Iceland from one of Richard Allen's models. And, and uh, it looks like it's continuous down below 400 kilometers. It's a hot spot or a plume or not a plume or whatever you stand on that debate. Um, uh, it's whatever it is. Um, and you say, well, it's continuous. This is, this is important. But, you, but what you want to know is, well, is it really continuous? What if it stopped at 200 kilometers depth? Would it get smeared down like this? I mean, any time you have a, a, a data like this where it's a bunch of data on one island with stuff coming in vertically to that island, you're going to get vertical smearing. Um, is that what happens here? So you really want to, instead of doing checkerboards, you want to do hypothesis testing. So say, well, this is just a slow anomaly that's constrained above 200 kilometers. And then I run that through my resolution test, and I get a damped anomaly that's smeared down a little bit, but it doesn't go all the way down to the model like our, our, uh, uh, like our uh, observed model. And there's other stuff going on here. This is actually more complicated than simple resolution matrix testing in this particular paper. They're doing numerical calculations and lots of stuff, stuff, stuff. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> I don't want to go into the details of it, but really resolution testing should be hypothesis testing. 
ideally is not just um, checkerboards. And the constraints of a 10-page paper or less, oftentimes we show you a few checkerboards. But um, and if you are really wanting to interpret that model, you want to do hypothesis testing. Um, the other question is, OK, so we can resolve structure. What's the error in that structure? How certain are we in the structure that comes out? Um, and, uh, and one of the interesting things is here, as we decrease damping, so we decrease the value of that epsilon squared. We put um, more and more emphasis on matching the data exactly. It turns out when you run through the resolution matrix test, it depends on that choice of regularization. And for relatively small regularization, you're going to often get what looks like very good resolution. Um, it'll look like I stuck my checkerboard in and I got my checkerboard exactly out. It's perfect. I can see the Earth. This My model is real. Um, but what happens is um, uh, if we propagate the errors, we might find out that we're resolving the model really well, but there's huge errors in it. Um, and so, uh, so we want to talk about propagating the data error. Um, once again, we have mathematical tools to do that. Um, in the simple uh, language of linear algebra, um, it's, you can propagate the data covariance into uh, a posteriori model covariance. covariance. I'm saying a posteriori here because we're going to talk about a priori in a bit. Um, um, this, uh, this is an example from this afternoon's tutorial just plotting up the, the variance. The covariance matrix actually has how um, model parameters are correlated with each other. This is just saying the error of a particular model, but it depends on the choice of regularization. These are two different regularization choices. They have very similar patterns. Um, this is not visible here, unfortunately, but the amplitude of the errors in this one is twice the amplitude of this one. This one was less damped. There was less re regularization on this particular inversion, um, and it got larger apparent errors. It's, uh, um, so this, this propagation of error um, depends on your choice of regularization. Um, and so it's this interesting trade-off. This is from uh, an older paper of mine, but uh, uh, this is a bootstrap error map, but it's the same idea as that error propagation. And um, if you look at the overall amplitude, it's very low in the mid-mantle here. It looks like I have very low error. Um, but you'll also notice in the mid-mantle, I have very low resolution. I'm not resolving the structure, and I have low errors. So it's, I, I, I've got very low errors, but I'm biased towards my reference model. That is, a, that is the, the, the symptom of high regularization. If you've got very high regularization, you're damped towards your reference model. You're biased towards your reference model. Your errors show up as small because there's not much, you know, you can, you can perturb the data. You can add more errors to the data, and it won't change your model much because you're damping to your reference model so much. The error is just saying, given uncertainty in the data, what's my uncertainty in my model? And, um, and so there's a trade-off. I could change the damping here, and I can increase the resolution, but I will also increase the error. And so we, all, we, we exist in a trade-off land. Inverse theory is all about trade-offs. And so you have to explore these trade-offs. Um, OK, so another takeaway. Resolution error, important. That's the, nec the second half of the problem. Um, and they're both affected by regularization. So exploring regularization is vital. Um, and so in order to evaluate, you need that whole story. This looks like cross eyes. Um, uh, I, 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 don't, I like it. Um, so conceptually, if we want to be more um, understanding of what we can resolve, what we can't resolve, what data we can match, what data we can't match, we can think about spaces, vector spaces is the, the way you think about this. But all possible models exist in this white circle here. This is just a conceptual idea saying all possible models, any vector I can come up with, whatever value I can put in, exist in this white circle here. All possible values of data exist in this white circle here. Um, in order to go from any given model vector to a data vector, we just have to multiply by this G matrix. So that's our transformation to go from the model space to the data space. Um, and what you'll find out is if you take all possible models and take them into the data space, they won't fill up the whole data space. There are 
portions of the data that cannot possibly be predicted by any kind of model you can come up with. This is all the possible predicted data you can get for all possible models. The area outside that area is what we call the data null space. This is data that cannot be predicted by any model. Um, we can think about a transformation. This is a little, uh, a little uh, conceptual. It's not exactly rigorous. But you can think about um, transforming any possible data um, by the transpose operator, projecting it back into the model space. Um, and what you'll find is that there are models that cannot be reached by the data. In other words, models that have no influence on the data, models that do not affect the data at all. And so those areas out that are unreachable by the data are what we call the model null space. This is kind of a conceptual idea, but it's important. So the data null space here represents any vector that exists in that data null space are data, linear combinations of data that cannot be predicted. And so this is why we always have data misfit. There are portions of the data that cannot be predicted. So a cell that is sampled twice by two, data, two measurements with error, you cannot predict that difference because there's error. Um, so, uh, so that's the data null space. Um, uh, and if the data null space exists, which in general it will, um, it's impossible to match the data exactly. Two questions. Mark, um, you mentioned errors, but I guess in that models that you had, there was no discussion of error. It was really just a linear mapping. Yes. So um, what's the distinction between the error well, versus Well, because real that data, mapping? I mean, so you have an infinite, uh, the data can take any value whatsoever. And real measurements, of course, there are er it's, it's got uncertainty associated with it. So if you make the same measurement twice, you won't get the same number. So there's no, at, at this point, I haven't explicitly included error. I'm going to talk a little bit more about probabilistically how you can include that, but. but so when we look at the, that vector of data, that data includes errors in, in your thinking on this. Well, it, any, even if you're not explicitly writing down plus or minus some value, the measurements do include error because all measurements include error. There's, does that make sense? And if you just take the data and just, you, you could think you can come up with a vector that you can put in random numbers in that. There are, you could come up also, with combinations must, of data that cannot be matched. But there must be all other reasons besides just errors where sure. you can't map between those two sure. spaces. Sure. I mean, it can also be because our model is, uh, is inadequate to describe the data. Um, not you know, enough parameters. Not like enough parameters. Didn't include anisotropy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go anisotropy. Woo! <laughs> all right. Yeah, well, I was just going to bring that point that the model that your null space also could show the deficiencies of the exactly. of the it's model. That G error. matrix is not complete. Very so. good point. It's not just data error. It can also be related to um, the inability of the parameterized model to actually describe real data. Actually, I didn't mean so much the parameters of the model, but the constitution of the physical model that you put in, the G matrix, not M. Yeah, sure, sure. So the, 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 the shortcomings in the theory that went into defining G as well. Yeah, all of those things are in there. The model null space um, represents, so you, if you come up with a vector that when you multiply it by G, you get zero. That is a null vector of the model. Um, in magnetics, they call these things annihilators, which I think is cool. <laughs> Magnetic annihilators. Um, anyway, these are the existence of annihilators or null vectors uh, means that you can add in some arbitrary constant times any of these null vectors and still match the data exactly as well as you did before. So um, the, if you have a model null space, we have an infinite number of solutions because you can add in an arbitrary amount of that null vector and still match the data exactly as well as you did before. So model null space has to do with non-uniqueness. Data null space is inability to match the data exactly. The key to quantifying all of these things is a wonderful thing we call the singular value decomposition. I'm almost out of time. So we're going to talk about this more this afternoon in the tutorial. Um, but the idea is we come up with singular values and a series of uh, uh, we decompose this. This is something you can do in MATLAB. You just do SVD 
G, and you can get an answer. Um, I, you know, I, we're not going to talk about this, but you get a series of singular values um, and matrices that span the data space. So some combination of vectors that describe all possible data vectors, some combination of vectors that describe all possible model vectors, and they're all weighted by this matrix that, that's lambda here. That's a matrix of singular values. Um, and it has lots of zeros in it. Diagonal. Well, it, the top part here is diagonal. Um, it's actually, this, the way it's written right here, it would be n by m. So it's not square. But it consists of a square diagonal and then lots of zeros. And the parts, the vectors that are multiplied by these zeros live in the null space. Both data and model null space have these zero singular values. So this is a way of quantifying this. Um, and so any column vectors of u associated with zero singular values are data null space. Any column vectors of v associated with zero singular values are in the model null space. So we can quantify exactly what is the model null space, what is the data null space if we do the singular value decomposition. And this afternoon you're going to do some inversions with the singular value decomposition. Um, given this idea, though, we can define what we call the natural solution to the problem. And I put that in quotes because it's natural if you're thinking in terms of singular value decompositions. It's not natural if you're thinking about another approach. But anyway, the idea is we want a model that um, is simple. And so the simplest model would be one that has no null vectors in it. We have no contribution from the null vectors. We're not putting any structure and things that we do not constrain by the data. Um, and by minimizing the data error, we assume that we, we say that we match the data as well as we can within the non-null parts of the data space, and all the remaining error exists in the data null space. So everything that we can't match is because the model cannot match that. There is nothing you can do to match it. And it turns out if you go through the math to do this two problem, you get a solution that looks like this, which once you've done the singular value decomposition, which can be time consuming for large uh, or even prohibitive for very large models, um, uh, if, this is actually trivial. You just take the transpose and you're inverting a matrix that is diagonal, so it's, an, it's trivial to invert. So this is a very simple solution. Um, one thing you'll notice, though, if the errors end up looking like this. They're, they're proportional to the inverse square of these singular values. So if you have very, very small singular values, they give you very, very large errors. And numerically, small may be at really zero. It's just the computer gave you 10 to the minus 15th or something like that. And so often what we want to do is truncate, take very, very small singular values and say, those are zero. Um, and we're just going to ignore those. And this is another way of doing regularization. And this is an example from this afternoon. Um, this is. Um, putting a very, very low threshold, keeping almost all the singular values, and you get a model that's very speckly and doesn't look much like the Earth. It is not regularized enough. It has very large amplitudes and is very speckly. Um, as you increase the threshold and throw out more of these singular values, you get something that looks more smooth, looks more like the Pacific Ocean and the Ring of Fire and all of this sort of stuff. You can see it all there. And then if you put the threshold too high, all you get is structure where you have the most sampling, um, which in this case happens to be the Pacific Basin. Um, and so like you can see how this is an over truncated model. We're not, this is not the Earth. This is the Earth as seen by the most sampled paths. This is the Earth as seen by a lot of noise. So the, the, these are n members. So uh, the singular value allows us to quantify the data in model null space. We define a, a natural solution, and this is another way of doing regularization. Yeah. Okay, so if we look at the uh, map, maps you had on the previous slide, I have a, a, a how to think about this kind of question. So by uh, truncating these things, you get different pictures of the Earth, right? And so is it the, is, can I think about this? So suppose we look at the one in the bottom right, which is the, the most truncation. And you said that um, basically this is only telling you something about the areas where you have the densest sampling. Yes. So it, is it the case that that is for the Pacific and, and around the Ring of Fire and all that? Is that like, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, and 
maybe this isn't the, the right words here, but is that m a more accurate map for that region of the Earth? Not really, because I've reduced it to just the really, really oversampled paths. So I've got lots of stuff from Indonesia going to California, for example. And so I, I can say, on average, we got lots of fast paths there. It's fast for 50-second surface waves going from Indonesia to California. But that's not saying anything about what's happening in between that relies on sample, all, all the less sampled path geometries. So this isn't more accurate in any sense of the term. It's just showing the really oversampled paths. What, what do I have to do to fit those? Um, if I can follow up on that. Actually, it's less accurate because so you can actually, even if you look at it, you see that it's much smoother. By zeroing out all of those eigenvalues that are not zero, you've thrown away some information, on, or in the sense of you've thrown away your ability to infer the correct values of model parameters. Well, it's only smoother outside no, but it's smoother it's inside even the smooth, region. It's even smoother inside here. It's very it's smooth comparison. outside. Um, outside of that region, but even inside, you've smoothed out. I mean, there, it looks like there's structure here. That's just it's pixelation, just really. There, it's but the color bar has changed. Yeah. Oh, um, and and so the way in which this this allows you to produce a natural model, this is a comment, is only natural for the suboptimal illumination that you have. So in some sense, you're actually mapping heterogeneities in your sampling into your model, sure. which is perhaps not what you would want to do. Yeah, it's, a, it's absolutely not what you'd want to do. This is, this is just another example of the trade-offs of choices of regularization. If I have no regularization and I, I, I almost don't truncate it at all, I match the data very well, but I've got all the speckling, which is just mapping noise into the structure. Over here, we're map we've truncated it so much that we're just mapping insufficient sampling into the structure. But th either way, we're not at the right, we're not in an optimum choice. So is 0 0.05 or 0 0.1? I mean, are they sort they're, of, they're, they look pretty similar. They look I mean, similar. There's slight difference in amplitude, slight difference in smoothness. This is in the range of acceptable answers, I would say. There's so usually not a both? right choice. There's a range of choices. So which do you show? Which, which, and what's that, which, of, of these models, which one would you end up showing in a, in, in a paper, for instance? You know, this is the dirty secret. It's the one we like the best. <laughs> With yeah, there's not that much difference here, right? So you know, there's not that I, much difference. So you pick matter. one, and then and ideally in the paper you say, well, what's the range of acceptable? I, I'm sorry that I keep on commenting, but I just want to make sure that, that the students in the audience don't come away with the impression that in, in tomography or in any inverse problem, what you do is just very parameters that smooth or regularize your model, and this is equivalent to the regularization, and then pick one that you like. No. I think it's much what w the reason that we sometimes have to resort to doing this is because we cannot properly quantify the data uncertainty and the model, our prior information on the model. If we're able to capture that prior information, so for example, if you know that structures won't vary by plus or minus 10 uh, in, in that panel on the left, then you don't even need to consider that model. We can reject it a priori. If we can uh, quantify our data uncertainty, so uh, then we can also say, you know, perhaps we can choose between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 in a quantitative way and say that our data is measured with the precision, with such precision that we can make that map. Sure. I mean, so if the better the data we have and the better constraints we have from, you know, I don't know, people doing experiments on mineral physics, um, all of those sorts of things, um, the, that, that lets us constrain what the range of acceptable models are. Yeah, I, w I was also going to ask you about, you know, how you pick up one to the other because, I mean, it sounds from what you're describing that eventually you're going to use essentially geological insights or maybe a priori knowledge like, oh, well, I do want to see the southern part of the East Pacific rise in my model. That doesn't work on the last one, so I won't take that model. But I'm wondering if there's any quantitative criterion you can use. For example, 
the model size that you described before, if you were to plot the model size versus your truncation parameters, do you have some kind of shape in that so curve that you would be able to use so to say... That's good. That's too far. So, so we can we you, you you can you can look in those those L curves and that gives you a a, a better range. Um, if we have actually very good constraints on the data uncertainty and the model uncertainty, then you can define a term called chi squared, and the normalized chi squared should be close to one, and that will give you what is the right answer. But of course. Some of these uh, numbers are not actually that well constrained, so that that still is going to give you a range. There are quantitative tools you can have, but usually there's some degree of arbitrariness in there, and so you, you there's a reasonable range for any inverse approach, and that reasonable range becomes narrower as we have better and better constraints on the data error and the model error, and the theory. I, I've not talked about theory at all in this particular thing, but the theory is everything that goes into that G matrix. And so this is very important. And we're out of time. I was going to do one last, so this is the takeaway five here. I was going to do stuff about Bayes' theorem, and I'm just going to show this XKCD because, you know, you've got to have an XKCD thing. And, um, we'll, um, uh, we're we're going to end your, end your tutorial this afternoon. Um, in your tutorial this afternoon, you're going to talk about uh, one of the uh, approaches you're going to use is what's called the Tarantola and Vallette method. That's what we describe it in here. It's from a paper by Albert, Albert Tarantola from uh, the 80s. Yes. Um, <laughs> what? Yes. I, I've read the paper many times. I just don't remember the year. Um, uh, and you're, you're, you're going to have, uh, you're, you're going to talk about that. And that basically, I mean, um, Underneath it all is this idea of maximizing the probability of a model, and this lets us define a lot of the things. I'm skipping through a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot of these things that we had in that damped least squares inversion actually in terms of covariances, things that are rigorously statistically defined. Um, and so we're going to talk about that in the tutorial. I won't talk about it now because we'll talk about it in the tutorial. Um, uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about, just real briefly, you can use that idea of probabilities to look at nonlinear problems. Um, and the, these are what we call modern techniques, but just to describe, I mean, these are very become very important in the last 10 years, but to, just to say they're modern techniques is maybe a little misleading because the first Monte Carlo inversion that I know of is in 1968. So it's, our modern techniques have still been around a while. <laughs> um, what? Yes. Well, so the, the the algorithm that people use is the Metropolis algorithm, which and that's uh, was initially de derived for something about decay of uranium. I you know I I don't remember, but Metropolis was one of the the mathematician physicists in on the Manhattan Project, and you've got Fermi's in on it, and you've got yeah neutrons. That's right. That's right. Neutron. I, I I've read this, but I haven't. Uh, anyway, it does go back to the Manhattan Project, but this is the first geophysical example I know of. Um, I, I, I just want to show that I have some model or another from VED. I, li I just like the fact that I've got that title on the slide. I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you sent it to me, though, so <laughs> um, it's a takeaway. When you're evaluating an inverse model, um, Lots of questions. First thing you want to know is what's the data? Um, the data are the, is the most important thing. And then you start asking, is it linear? What kind of theory? All of these things add on to that. But the first part you want to know is the data. The data. And then you can start thinking about these details about regularization, inverse technique, all of that. And if you ever want textbooks, there's lots of them out there. These are free, <laughs> available as PDFs online. Um, a lot of my early stuff is Minky. That's the kind of classical stuff. Um, Tarantola has all the probabilistic stuff. Parker is if you want to torture yourself with linear algebra. Uh, <laughs> those are your options. Okay.